Uh, our final talk for the morning, Amy Stutz, the Hunter's Slingshot, Protostellar Ejection from Filaments in Orion. Can everybody hear me? Yeah? OK. Great. All right. So today I'm going to tell you about how we identified for the first time two phases of molecular cloud evolution within Orion and begun to understand why Orion's high mass allows the second phase to emerge, in sharp contrast to the nearby regions, lower mass regions that are usually considered, or at least often considered, as archetypal. So. Taurus hosts famous examples of straight line filaments with kinks in them. And in fact, this is true for many of the nearby regions that have been observationally scrutinized so far. Here we see many examples. And when we compare to simulations, we find qualitatively good agreement. We see straight line filaments uh, with kinks in them. And these are simulations that include uh, turbulence, uh, but it's also true when they also include magnetic fields. But when we compare these simulations and observations on the top to the integral shape filament in the northern portion of Orion, the differences are obvious. So what are these differences? The northern portion of Orion is a dynamical object. It is a high line mass filament, as I will describe. And these are the main these these differences to the nearby uh, filaments is the main are the main results that we report on in our paper. So using uh, one of these Herschel uh, dust column density maps uh, that Doug just so kindly described as trash. <laughs> we extract the line mass profile for the integral shape filament in the north and the southern portion of the cloud, L1641. And we see that the line mass profile is a function of radius, or I should say impact parameter from this dust ridge line. is very well characterized by a power law, both in the north and in the south. But in the north, where the structure is completely dominated by one uh, filament, whereas in the south we're averaging over more structures, but the L1641 uh, profile converges with the integral shape, shaped filament profile at large radii. So using, uh, I should say, yeah, using uh, this, this uh, mass per unit length profile, we can calculate a density profile, assuming cylindrical geometry, and the gravitational potential for the cloud. And this just gives the, the evaluation in terms of number densities, which might be more familiar to people here. Uh, and so what, what's happening with the protostars and the stars in the cloud? Well, we see that the protostars are almost exclusively located on the filament in the north, and almost so in the south, whereas the stars are much more spread out in space. Now, if this is a dynamical object, like I've been describing it as, this should be true kinematically as well. And this is exactly what we see. The protostars are on the filament, they're yellow points, and the stars are blue, and they're more spread out. The grayscale in the back is the 13CO map. So this is a position velocity diagram. And we see exactly what I just described. I should note that here when I say stars, I mean spits are characterized disk sources. But anyway, stars with disks, so young stars. Now. Using the offsets from these position and velocity ridge lines that we've defined, we can construct phase space diagrams. So the axis ratios on these diagrams are set to 1 million years. So elongated structures in these diagrams immediately tell you that we're talking about short time scales. In addition, we've color coded the points according to their location north to, or south to north through the cloud. Uh, and so we can see that the, uh, these, these structures are very clumpy in phase space. They still have a lot of phase space structure, which is consistent with the idea of these short time scales, these elongated structures. And we can push that a little bit further and look at the velocity distributions, uh, the velocity distributions of the protostar stars and stars in the ISF and find that the ISF stars should be bound by comparing to the uh, gravitational potential that we derived from the Herschel column density map. Now, when we combine these velocities, 
with the positional offsets, we can get dynamical time scales. And what we find is that the dynamical time scales for the clouds are quite short, excuse me, for the stars are quite short, about 0.4 and 0.6 million year for the northern and the southern portion, respectively. So what we think is going on here is that this filament is oscillating. And as the protostars still have a dense envelope, they stay coupled to the dense gas in the system. But as they become compact enough, they will be released from, they can't be dragged along anymore with the gas, and they will decouple from the gas. And they'll have the velocity at the point of last contact with the gas. And they'll just move according to Newton's first law away from the filament. Sort of like a wet dog wagging its tail, and the drops are flying off. And, and here we show the, uh, the semi-amplitude of the oscillations, if this is a transverse wave, in terms of position and velocity. And these would give an approximate time scale of about 0.6 million years, I believe. So that's how we think the cloud is different. But why? Why is it different? That's the real question that we have to answer now. So if we have equality between two opposing forces, we expect instabilities to be driven through the system, very simply. So we have the mass, as I just described, but we ha also have the highest magnetic field measurements. And we can compare these on large scales and on small scales. And what we find is that on large scales, the cloud is bound and trapped deep in its gravitational potential because of its high mass. But that on small scales, the magnetic field energy density is comparable to the gravitational potential energy, potentially leading to oscillations being driven through the system. But there's another type of instability as well that might develop. So the Zeeman splitting observations also give us the direction perpendicular to the plane of the sky for the field. And what we find is that on one side of Orion, the field is coming out of the plane of the sky, and on the other side, it's coming in. We combine this information with linear polarization, and this is consistent with a slinky-like field, a helical field, enveloping the entire filament. And this could lead to pinching instabilities. And indeed, in the north, so this is a column density map, so the, stella, the stars don't show up, there's two clusters, which apparently have an age gradient between them, and then we have the ONC, which is forming today. So what we think this is, this, what's happening here is that this is like the action of a whip traveling through the cloud, leading to these pinching instabilities. Maybe it's a torsional wave, not a transverse wave. But anyway, we have these instabilities traveling through the cloud, leading to these, and we see these clusters in the north that are spaced, spatially and in time, going down to the ONC. So they might have been digesting. So these oscillations may have digested the cloud that previously connected to Orion B to the north. So what, in this scenario, what we put forward is that the structure in many of the nearby regions is consistent with the initial conditions of turbulence. But that, in fact, the ONC has reached this, this next phase of, of internal evolution, which is permitted by its mass, and that it's this mass uh, that allows for this intensification and concentration of the magnetic fields and leads to cluster formation. So there's two basic ways, ways forward with this picture. One is to get people to start simulating clouds with these self-consistent, self-generating helical magnetic fields. And the second is to identify Orion analogs. Thank you. Hello, Amy. Uh, have you checked on the Planck maps if, uh, yeah, it's if the morphology of, uh, yeah, but also the polarization percentage, if it's consistent with this idea of having uh, uh, a helicoidal field? Like if you see a uh, depolarization the center. Presented. No, I haven't checked that. Maybe you can help me do that later today. Yeah, well, you and I have discussed this before, but uh, uh, why? Why would you need to resort to magnetic fields here and not just attribute it to just an evolutionary effect on the on the clusters of YSOs and uh, stars and disks? Yeah, uh, so like the standard picture of gas dispersal 
versus these pinching instabilities causing these magnetic explosions. Yeah, just assuming that the filament is there, it's forming stars, and then the cluster dynamics just expel the objects. And so the, the well, older they are, the more time they have to travel. Ah, you mean the stellar velocity dispersion. Why it, am I interpreting it as these oscillations exactly. versus M-body interactions? Mm -hmm. The protostars are very cold, and they're forming at the bottom of a deep gravitational potential. And it's not that we have 10 stars where one of them or two of them get heated kinematically. It's that the entire population has an inflated and heated velocity field. So it's hard to imagine how you have these things at zero velocity trapped cold down there at the bottom, generically have these inflated velocities without oscillations. I think that in the end, it'll be shown that in body interactions are contributing to the velocity dispersions that we, we measure. But currently, the picture that we're putting forward is this oscillation to account for, for this heating. OK. Let's, let's talk about it. The density of the protostars is very low at the bottom, Enrique. Amy, great talk. Very exciting, as usual. I have two questions that should be quick. So if the whip is really driving the ejection of these stars, then it seems like if they have a constant ejection velocity, and you know, there are enough stars that you're well sampling it, then you should end up with some line of stars where the separations are basically scaling as one over the frequency. In other words, if you eject them very rapidly, you have a lot of beads on the string. And if you eject them quite slowly, then each one has time to travel out. So you have a very sparse string. So have you looked at whether the separation in the perpendicular to the filament direction actually does have some regular structure? Um, no, we haven't. That's a good idea. I'm just trying to find the figure. So you mean projected or in velocity? But it seems like this should be true in both. I mean the distances, although obviously you'd have to involve with the angular distribution. No, we haven't looked at that, but we can scrutinize this figure. Maybe it's easier to see on the computer screen. Yeah, and then the other question was, did you think about whether the magnetic field could drive the oscillations and ask you know, if it's magnetic tension, does the frequency of the oscillation uh, agree with what you'd estimate from the B-field strength or whatever right. estimate you so, have? So this is where probably people would advise me to not be so honest. But basically, I don't know anything about magnetic fields. And we were drawn in by the work. Then I went back and tried to calculate some sort of velocity, alphane, blah, blah, you know. And it was a mess. It was a mess. So I'm here to beg you guys to explain these things to me. And these helical fields, pinching instabilities, torsional waves, all these things. The good ideas, and I'm not an expert, so. All right, let's uh, thank all the speakers for this morning.